This is Glambition Radio, episode number 237 with Shelley Archambault, author of Unapologetically Ambitious. Welcome to Glambition Radio. I am your host, Allie Brown. I'm an entrepreneur, mentor, investor, and mom of twins. I love thinking big, doing different, and exploring ideas that disrupt the status quo, especially when it comes to women, because we are rewriting the rules for leadership, business success, making money, and changing the world. And we're doing it with style. Let's go. I can't wait for you to hear this interview today because in a culture where we are primed to apologize from a very young age, Shelley Archambault, who is a Silicon Valley leader, is giving us permission to achieve more without the guilt. And it's all in her new book, Unapologetically Ambitious. This woman is on the boards of companies you know, like Verizon and Nordstrom, and her advice is spot on. On For those of you who are in corporate careers or entrepreneurial, I gained so much from this and you're going to love getting to know Shelly today. Quick shout out to two reviews my team pulled for me from Apple Podcasts. The first is Ioana Garrett from the US. Allie, 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 you never ever fail to deliver the goods, amazing resources and the most inspiring guests on your show. I've been sharing your podcast with all of my business peers and clients because I want them to elevate too. I realize I've been holding myself back from hitting that seven figures and that changes today. Time to reinvent myself. And the next one is She Just Knows by Nicole Loves Social from Australia. I've been an Alley follower since 2009. I've learned so much from her over the years and watched her grow into the amazing business leader she is today. Glambition Radio is an awesome mix of learning, uncovering, and fun. Plus, throw in some epiphanies. You'll learn so much from her and her guests. Thank you. And a reminder that we love the reviews. It really does help us get more eyes on the show. And you know, when you're skimming through things and you you see the review number and when it's higher, it just gives you more confidence in trying out a show or checking something out. It only takes about two minutes and we'd so, so appreciate it. And a quick reminder that our show today is sponsored by The Trust, the new private premier network for seven and eight figure women entrepreneurs. We have some incredible events coming up and guests that I cannot announced just yet. And I'm not talking about another inspirational keynote. I'm talking about women who have built nine figure billion dollar companies who are spending time with us in the room. If that sounds like something you'd be interested in, check this out. If you or another female leader, you know, is craving more powerful connections, more elevated conversation and a modern platform for connecting with other high performing women globally, visit jointhetrust.org for more details and to request a brief informational interview. We would love to tell you more about it. You could see if it's a fit for you and your goals going into 2021. I'll tell you one thing that I've learned over the years in my own experience, as well as observing hundreds and hundreds of the women entrepreneurs I've worked with at the higher levels. As you ascend your revenues and grow your team and get to those places at a different level, your who becomes more important than the what. It's your connections, it's your network. And if you are in the same networks that you've been in before, or ones in your own industry where you're all pulling up your wagons in a circle and looking at each other, it's not going to happen. So check this out. It's so different. And people said, you know, Allie, thank you. New times require a new network and the women need to connect at higher levels. Join the trust.org. Now get ready for a fantastic interview with Shelly Archambault. Shelly, can you tell me where you are at this very moment? I am sitting in a car outside of a COVID testing location. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you don't mind, but I just have to give that context of because course. this is obviously, you just get stuff done. 
don't you? Yes, absolutely. You just figure out how to make it all work. Well, it, it, the sounds good in the car. So this actually sounds great. I'm, I'm glad that you have a good connection and we're, we're all set. So we were introduced by my good friend, Kara Golden, and she just said, you have to have this woman on your show, her story, her new book, her career. And I'm pretty sure I'd seen your name around maybe on some like conference, you know, speaker lists and, and things like that. I kind of knew of you. But to dig into the book and the the depth of your experience, everything you've been through, you know, I've been on a bit of a journey before I've even talked with you. I'd love to start, though, with the book and and why you wanted to write this book. You've obviously had a great career without needing a book. Why a book and why now? Well, that's a great question because I'm very goal oriented. And frankly, writing a book was never a goal. <laughs> so it wasn't it wasn't to become like this author alley and that was like on my list. No, what happened was I've tried throughout my career to be very accessible, frankly, and responsive. So people reach out to me and I respond. I still do. But what happened is I got more and more responsibility as I built my career. I could still respond and make that time, but I couldn't meet with everyone that wanted to meet with me and pick my brain and hear the strategies and all those things. And it really pained me that I couldn't because I really do try to be helpful because I have had so much help and support throughout my career. Mm. So I said, you know what? One day when I get to phase two and have a bit more flexibility, I'm going to write it down. Mm. I'm just going to write it down so that I can share it. And that way when people say, oh, I want to hear your story or pick your brain, et cetera, I can say, here, here's a book. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of all in one place. You're right, because these days our, our advice is kind of scattered, right? We're, we're, we do webinars and podcasts and speeches. And the book is kind of like, I don't want to say your swan song, but it's like it's like the, the one place that you could, it's, it's a bit of a legacy play. It, yeah, it absolutely indoors, right? And the topic is an evergreen one. Mm. And honestly, I wrote it because people were like, gosh, do we really need another book? I mean, I don't I have no idea how many books have been published. But what I'll tell you is I didn't find one like the one I wrote. My book is very much a, huh, here's how to improve your odds to get mm. what you want out of life by being intentional. And I share stories through short chapters. And when I say short chapters, I mean, there's something like 44 chapters in the book. So it tells you how short the chapters are. Short chapters, tons of practical tips, take away. If you read the book and walk away with less than 10 things that you can go do tomorrow, then I have failed. So mm. it was meant to be also be candid. So there's what worked for me, what didn't. Struggles I had with my daughter, right? Based on decisions I made, struggles I had with myself. I had to get a psychologist. I mean, life is hard. These decisions and these trade-offs and these choices, they are hard. And people don't talk about that. It always sounds like, oh, I took step one, step two, step three, and bing, right? Maybe you had one little problem, one little hurdle, but it all went well. And then when other women see that, and then they look at how hard their lives are. They think, well, gosh, maybe I'm just not cut out for this. Mm -hmm. And the answer is, yes, you are. It's hard for everybody. And so I wanted people to see that. But there are things that you can do to lighten that load, to make it a little easier. And I just wanted to get that out. When, when we go back in your career and even to when you were growing up, and the title of the book is Unapologetically Ambitious. And, and I was reading an interview that you did and you mentioned something like every time you joined an organization, whether it was the Girl Scouts or the French Club, that you eventually would end up leading it. Like, did you see that as a gift or a curse? Like, <laughs> like, like, like extra responsibility. Yeah, it's a really good question. But I'll be candid. I saw it as a gift because here's what I learned in those early days was, huh, if you're leading things, you have more say on what the group actually does mm -hmm. and on what your particular role is. And I thought, I kind of like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's worth doing the extra work to be able to have more impact. So yeah, I actually grew to like it, which is why ultimately I decided I wanted to be a CEO. Yeah. It made me laugh because it made me think of that. That happened to me a lot over the years as well. And there there was a point, and this is a random story. I don't even think I've ever shared this, but it's just funny. There was one point when I was trying different things on, you know, this is only 10 years ago in LA that like I, I joined a band and was singing 
and just joined these guys for like a few sessions. And within a few sessions, they all kind of turned and looked at me and said, we'd like you to be the music director. And I'm like, no, can I just show up to something and, <laughs> and be in the group? I don't want to lead another thing. And so I was laughing and kind of just thinking of that, you know, the, the does this always have to come with such responsibility? But, you know, it in so many places, it has has helped you know, to have that gift. And then you realize the impact you can have as a leader on others. Yeah. I know it's true. And the point you raised, and you asked me if early on, I found it as a curse or a gift. And I said, definitely a gift. But I'll tell you now, I find myself in the same position where, you know, people would be happy for me to lead a whole bunch of things. (laughs) The answer is no, I can't lead everything. (laughs) Yeah. So tell tell me about the evolution of your career a bit. Can I know it may be hard, but can you give us kind of a modified timeline to help us understand you know the evolutions of of who you've become? Absolutely. So I came out of Wharton and joined IBM with the goal of becoming. I said I want to be CEO. I wanted to be in tech because tech's a growing industry. IBM is the leader at the time. This is the 80s. And I said, I'll go be CEO of IBM. Well, so you came out like guns a blazing. You were ready. Oh, yeah. Pantyhose, everything. This was IBM. I decided in high school I wanted to be a CEO. Wow. Yeah. And only because my guidance counselor, you know, that obligatory conversation you have when you're a junior year, Mm -hmm. getting ready to do college applications and plans and all kind of good stuff. And she said, what do you want to do after college? I said, I don't know. She goes, what do you like to do? I said, oh, clubs. I love running my clubs. I do this, this, this. And she said, oh, well, you know, businesses are just like clubs, pull people together to a common objective and get things done. And I said, done, because I loved having goals. I'm going to go run a business. Did you even know what a CEO was? No, of course not. I just said, I'm going to run a business. And when I looked around, the people that run businesses were called CEOs. So I said, great, I'm going to go be a CEO. Wow. It was literally that naive and that audacious all at the same time. (laughs) Sometimes it serves you, right? Yeah. What was IBM like back then? Oh gosh. You know, IBM, IBM was actually a great company. They really invested in their people, lots of training, developed really good management skills, leadership skills, et cetera. Uh, As a matter of fact, we used to tease at times that they were actually an amazing personnel company that happened to sell computers Mm -hmm. (laughs) because they invested so much with regards to people. So it was a great great training ground and a wonderful place to learn. But I got to the point after 14 years, I was the youngest Black executive named. I was the first Black female to go on an overseas assignment. I was now reporting to, my boss reported to Lou Gerstner, the CEO. So I'd done really well. Nobody hired me in the organization that looked like me. But it wasn't clear to me that I was still going to get a shot at really becoming CEO of IBM. Yeah. And becoming CEO was more important to me than IBM because Mm -hmm. that was the goal. So I ended up leaving IBM and worked my way via a stint at Blockbuster, ultimately to Silicon Valley, where I was the chief marketing officer and EVP of sales for a couple of public companies. And then I got my opportunity to be CEO of what became Metricstream, which I built from a fledgling broken company into a global market leader in governance, rest and compliance over 14 years. And I passed the baton back in 2018 and have been serving on boards. I'm in now phase two. So I serve on public boards like Verizon, Nordstrom, Roper, and Okta. I also nonprofits like Catalyst and Braven. And I advise companies and coach some CEOs. I write, obviously, and try to share and inspire and impact others to be able to achieve their objectives. So that's what I'm doing. Yeah. Do you like the variety now that you're enjoying? Or do you feel like you need something else to jump into, like really get meaty with again? I'll be honest right now, you know, I call it phase two, because who knows, there might be a phase three. But right now, I'm actually enjoying the variety. And it's serving, you know, the purpose I wanted to write the book, get the book out there, and you need time to do that. So I'm still, you know, learning and contributing and impacting. And we'll see, we'll see what happens. Mm. But right now, I'm good. So what is the unapologetic about the ambitious. I get you're ambitious already, but I'm curious about the unapologetic part of this. Yeah. So the unapologetic piece is, and it really came uh, to two places. One is having conversations with friends and we got to talking about the fact that women apologize for everything. And I said, you know what? I feel like we are raised from birth to apologize. Mm -hmm. And I said, and it's crazy because we apologize and maybe 5% of the time it's for something that we actually did that was wrong. The other 95% is to make the rest of the world feel better. 
We do it to show empathy, to ease tension, to show we care. We we do it to create, you know, relationships, to ease tensions. We use it like salt. You mm. know, it just makes everything a little better when you keep saying, I'm sorry. Mm. And we got to stop doing that because other people think we actually are sorry. And therefore we look weak. And I was like, you know what? That's it. That's mm-hmm. it. And plus my daughter had written something that really hit home when she was at post-college that also talked about the fact that she was facing the world unapologetically. And the combination of the two was just like, you know what? That's it. Unapologetically ambitious. We all have a right to be ambitious and we don't and shouldn't have to apologize for it. Yeah. Did you know that there were people around you going like, man, she's, she's a lot to handle or she's too much or, <laughs> you, you, you know, cause there's that unapologetic. And also we immediately start thinking, gosh, maybe am I, am I too much like coming in with these opinions and, and leading like this? Like, is that why you want to make it clear to, to women and girls that they don't need to feel that way or have be worried about people thinking that? Yeah, actually, it's it's actually slightly different, Ali, because I actually wasn't that person, believe it or not. As a black female, I've got a finer, women have a fine line between, you know, ambitious, assertive and aggressive and, right, bitchy, right? Oops, I, I used the word anyway, you told me. To- <laughs> oh, that doesn't qualify for our, our explicit oh. label, don't worry. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> I was like, oops. <laughs> But anyway, but women have women have a narrow path, right, to walk, but black women have a much narrower path to walk. And so I don't believe I would have gotten to where I was if I actually had any of that attitude where people felt I was too much. So mm. being unapologetic is not the attitude. You know, it's not like, hey, I'm here to take over the world and get in line, right? That's that's not what it is. What it really is is to say you have every right to be ambitious. Don't play it down. Don't hide it, right? And what is ambitious? Ambitious to me, all that means is that you have goals, you have aspirations that you want to achieve and you are going to be intentional and work toward them. Mm. And this can be in business. It can be in family. It can be in the community. You know, having ambition means you just want to make an impact and you're willing to do what's necessary to go make that happen. One of the most ambitious people I know was my mother. She never worked outside of the home Mm -hmm. after she's getting married. So I don't, I tie it a little differently when I see ambitious. So the unapologetically is not so much, hey, attitude, right? As it is, it is okay. Stand up, right? Do what you need to do with intention. I actually tried throughout my career to create environments in which people wanted to help me Mm. achieve what I was trying to achieve. That was my approach. Yeah. Tell us some things we can learn from you. You know, most women listening are entrepreneurs, but you know, many of us are now growing teams and, and companies that could become very large. And we're going to be, you know, working with teams and working with different types of people. Give us some of your practical tips or maybe, you know, your philosophies on how you've worked with teams and you just said, you know, getting them to be on board with your vision and want to help you and all come together. And, and I want everyone listening to point, you know, when, when we, when we start a company ourselves, it's, you know, our, our vision is implicit. It, it's, it's, people are coming on board knowing that's going to happen. You have to re- realize when people move from different companies, different cultures, different places in the world and take these different types of positions when they're leading businesses you have to restart that process all over, don't you? Yes, you do. And as a matter of fact, even when I took over, you know, the company of became Metric Stream, it was very much a startup, you know, it had very, it had very 60 people. I took it down to less than that and rebuilt the thing up to over a thousand. So it was, um, I've been on all sides of this large and small. And what I'll tell you is, you know, the number one piece about leading and leading teams is what makes you a leader is not your title, not the fact that you now call yourself a CEO. It's whether people will follow you when the path is not clear. Mm. When the path is clear, people can see. They can see around and you're not as important because I can see what's in front of me, right? Whether you tell me or show me or whatever or not, I can see it and I'm making that judgment. When the path gets less clear, yeah. when challenges come and that path gets dark, heck, I'm not following that leader if I don't actually believe 
in that person. Believe that they have the right vision, right? The right strategy that they care about me, that they have the best interest, not only for where the company goes, but where I go. You know, that's what people want in a leader that they follow. Mm -hmm. So the key is to become a leader that people want to follow. Mm. Because if you're building a company, I mean, Metric Stream, we had at least two near-death experiences. <laughs> you know, building a company is not for the faint of heart. Mm -hmm. And you want to make sure that your team will stick by you mm -hmm. when those ups and downs happen. Is it a trust factor? It is. Trust is absolutely a big piece of it. So it is, you know, I, I tell people it's all about trust. It's about communicating, which tends to drive the trust. It's also about this notion I talked about caring. People want to know you care about them, that you have their best interests at heart. Mm. Fundamentally, that's what they want to know. And then they want to see that you're actually making good decisions, that you're rational in what's done. Yeah. That you are not afraid. You know, they want to make sure that you are the strength. When they're afraid, they want to look at you and make sure, okay, are we all right? You know, are we okay? Because I'm concerned. But if you're okay, then I'm okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you need to be that, that steady person. You know, I tell leaders all the time, leaders have to be careful because I find that things are never as good as they appear, nor as bad as they appear. So if you are rising with when it's great and dropping when, when it's not, you're going to yo-yo your entire company. So just keep telling yourself, it's never as good as it appears and it's never as bad as it appears and try to hold yourself pretty steady. And then you become that steady, solid support that your team needs during challenging times. Yeah. There's, there's been some debate around the whole authenticity thing. And I, I, I do think there's times that people are, well, it, it's, it would seem to me that some leaders sometimes are too transparent. What's your philosophy on that? When you're, when you need to hold ground and be the solid one, you know, what's your, what's your theory on that? You know, it's interesting. I think it's important to be able to share as much as you can share, but you want to be a little careful. And that you don't want to share so much that you're scaring people. Yeah. Because that's almost not fair, right? That's part of your job. Part of your job is to, to handle that. Yeah. Right? There were, there were times during MetroStream days when, I mean, I didn't know on Tuesday if we were going to have payroll for Friday. Wow. All right? Now, I wasn't going to go tell everybody, hey, I'm not sure we got payroll, right? But right. keep working hard. <laughs> All right? You know, no, that, that makes no sense. Yeah. All right? Now, did people know that cash was tight? They absolutely did. Right? Did they know that? Not, I mean, so you have to you have to create the right environment in which people feel informed. They know the challenge, right? They know the risk, but you don't want to give them so much that they are just scared. Mm. That's a good distinction. That they're aware of the challenges. You're open about the challenges, but you, the details aren't what you need to be sharing with everyone until you've got it figured out. Yeah, yeah. You shared something on an interview that I was just listening to today about how much you do as far as planning, that you're, you're very goal and oriented, which you mentioned, you have a drive towards planning. And it, it would seem to me that your career is quite planned out as well. So it's, tell me about how much of a planner you are, or maybe not. I, I really am not sure. Oh, no, no, you got it right. I'm a huge planner. I've lived my whole life, Ali, with asking myself the question, okay, what is it I'm trying to achieve? And then the next question I ask, so what has to be true for me to achieve it or make it happen? Ooh, wait, say that again. That's good. What has to be true? I ask myself what has to be true. Hmm. And then the next question I ask is, how do I make it true? I love that. And those are the questions that I ask for everything. This is true in my personal life. It's true in my professional life. It's how I approach life. What is it that I want? what has to be true, and then how do I make it true? And my how do I make it true is the plan. Yeah. Okay. And I literally create the plan and then I go execute. So what that does is it brings clarity on what your steps should be. Because here's what happens. A lot of people set goals and some people create plans to achieve those goals. But what makes the difference and where the real power is is in making decisions every day consistent with your plan. Mm. Most people do not do that. Yeah. It's been a hard year for that too, though, to be frank. What would you tell people who've had a lot of trouble with that this year? Well, you, I mean, yes, things happen we can't control, 
and we need to adjust plans where we have to adjust plans. But at the same time, I'll tell you, having goals and plans gives you focus. Mm. What here's what happens to a lot of folks is all this stuff comes in. Everything's happening. Oh my God, the whole world's upside down. And they focus on everything and it's overwhelming. Mm-hmm. You know, and the, and the example I like to give is, you know, picture, picture a three or four-year-old, right? Three or four-year-old having fun, standing in the middle of the room, just starts spinning, right? They think it's so fun to get dizzy. They spin, 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 spin. They start to wobble. And next thing you know, bam, flat on their back, right? Typically giggling, mm-hmm. but flat on their back. All right. Now picture that with a professional dancer. The dancer gets up and spins, you know, five, six, seven, ten times. Boom, boom, boom. They come out of the spin and go right into some nice pirouettes and movements, right? No mm-hmm. dizziness. Why is that? Because a dancer picks a focal point. Mm-hmm. She looks or he looks at a spot. And they spin and then they bring your head right around. Quick snap and look right at that spot. Spin, snap their head back at the spot. And what that does is it keeps them focused and they don't get dizzy. Mm. Well, I believe in times like these that are chaotic with everything. I mean, everything, work, environment, home, everything's topsy-turvy. We need to find that focal point. Because otherwise, we just spin and spin and spin and you're flat on your back. I love that. It's been a spinning year. Yeah. <laughs> it has been. Listen, I, trust me. I absolutely know. It's been you know. that kind of a year. Yeah. Some of my clients have had the focal point and others are, you know, it, 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 and a little spinning's okay, right? Mm-hmm. But I love that. I love that metaphor because, and anyone who's done dance, even as a child, and you know, when you start to learn to do that, it changes everything. That's right. And so to me, goals and plans represent that focal point. Yeah. So don't just throw them out the window. Yeah. They might they need to be modified? Sure. Yeah. But don't throw them out the window. Stay focused and then make decisions consistent with the plan. And the way that works, the way I've made it work, Allie, is I assume that the plan I have in place is going to happen. Now, do I know it's going to happen? Even even in 2020. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in 2020. I just assume whatever it is I planned is going to happen. And therefore, mm-hmm. I make decisions today, assuming that what I plan for in three, four, five, eight years is going to happen. Mm-hmm. And what that does is it increases my odds of being lucky. You know, I'll give you an example. Uh, and people can read about this in the book who pick up the book. But, you know, I decided in college that I wanted to, if I could, I mean, first of all, I want to become a CEO, but I also want to get married. I want to have kids. And, you know, back to, okay, so what has to be true? Well, it means I need to find a husband who's very supportive, right? Is wants to support me in becoming CEO, is probably willing to take on more childcare work, homework, you know, that kind of thing. I need, I'm literally made out a list at wow. like 18, 19, I made out a list of here's here's what I need. And then my parents said, we'll help you with college or we'll help you with wedding. And of course, he picked college. So I had to pay for this wedding. Well, I'm like, gosh, well, all this works out. I want to get married in my early 20s. So I better start saving for a wedding. So I started saving for a wedding. I was working like mad in college because I had to pay my piece of the college and I had to save for my wedding fund. Mm-hmm. Now, my friends, that's crazy. Shelly, you're working. What do you mean on money? Well, I don't have money because it's all going into the bank for a wedding. What wedding? You're not even, you don't have a study boyfriend. You're not even engaged. What are you talking about, right? So what happened? Fast forward. I got married at 22 and I paid for my wedding. No loan. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. I was lucky. So that's what I mean. I made decisions and I've done that throughout my whole life, assuming it was going to happen. So when it did happen, I was ready for it. Yeah. I love that. I'm writing that down, the making the decisions, assuming it's going to happen. What I love about your stuff is, is that you're using new language to some things like we kind of knew, but I'm hearing this in a whole new way. Like what you said before, what has to be true? Just that phrase for me speaks to me when we're going back to the, um, yes. you know, the goal setting, what right. that did for me too, is it, that hit me not just on a business level, but like what has to be true about who I'm being, what has to be true about how I'm acting, what has to be true about what I believe about myself. Like that's yes. where I went with that. And I, right. I love that, but it, it's yeah. all these different levels now. It really is. Yeah. There's a story that I'd like you to repeat that if you can, <laughs> that I think was so 
illustrative of just how you think. And, and I was lucky to catch it because I, I connected with you on LinkedIn as I was stalking you, I mean, researching you for today. But this is where I find out the, the juicy little things to, to find, you know, and ask about. And you shared a story about a career move you made very early on where you made a very bold ask for not only, I believe, two positions or two titles instead of one. Oh, yeah. North Point. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Would you mind sharing that? Because that, I mean, I was listening to it out loud at my desk and even my assistant was here in the other room and we both were like, oh my God. <laughs> we're like, that story is incredible. And I just think it's it's something that everyone listening can learn from and being a little more in their power. Absolutely. Because people have more power than they realize. So here's what's transpired. I was living in Dallas. I uh, decided, you know, I'm in tech. I need to get to Silicon Valley. I'm interviewing for jobs. And I found one that I really wanted, uh, North Point. They were offering the job of being the executive vice president of sales. So that's what I was interviewing for. But the question I asked, and I always ask, is how are you going to measure success? Because many times how the boss is going to measure success is different from what's in the job description. Mm. And sure enough, right? Said, oh, well, we want you to, you know, grow, grow the business, reduce the cost of sale, improve customer satisfaction. And we need all this done like right away. We're, you know, we're in a hurry kind of thing. And I said, well, okay, well, if you want me to basically reduce the cost of sale, then I need to have marketing as well as sales Mm. because marketing drives at least half your cost of sale. Mm -hmm. And I had the conversation, but here's what I did. I didn't say, you know, you need to give it to me because I want to run marketing. What I said was, I would like for you to consider combining these jobs because otherwise I don't see how I'm going to achieve the objective you have, Mm. right? I put it in terms of their value, not mine. So they agreed to doing that. We negotiated salary. We're really close to all being done. They're going to move me and my family from Dallas to California. But remember, they talked about speed, right? Because they wanted me to start right away. Their speed, speed, speed. I said, okay. So I came back and I said, there's just one more thing. Speed is really important here. And therefore, I'd like you, and I always said that. I didn't say you have to, right? I'd like you to actually hire my assistant because she will enable me to get up to speed right away because she knows me, no learning, no training, right? We're going to hit the ground running. And that would mean moving her and her family to California too. (laughs) And they did. Was that on the phone or did you see his face when you asked for that? (laughs) Actually, that was on the phone. Um, I love that. that. That was a request. It was totally a request on the phone. Yeah. But the key is for all of it, it's putting the value of what you want. When you negotiate, it's not about what you want. It's all about putting things in the terms of the benefit and value that the person that has the power gets as a result of doing this for you. Right. So that's what I've done my whole career. You always try to put things, you know, in terms of how, how is this good for the person in front of you? How does it help them? What is the benefit, right? What is the feel good? Whatever it might be. Yeah. You linked it to the results for him that he stated that he wanted for the company. And to me, the other thing I loved about it is that shows how priceless good support is for a leader. Can you talk a bit about the team that you've surrounded yourself with, how you delegate? It's something that doesn't come easy for a lot of women. All right. It's all about the team, Ali. It's all about the team. And, you know, everything from an assistant, right, to who you have on the team itself, because you can have the best product, you can have the best, you have so many great things, but if you don't have the right team in place, it's just not happening. Whereas you can have a pretty good product, And you can have a pretty good market and you can have a pretty good, but if you have a great team, you're going to kill it. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking for a team, it's really important. You know, one of the things I like to say is we tend to hire people for what they know and for their experience, but we fire them for who they are. Mm. So spend time when you're interviewing, trying to understand who they are much more so than just what they've done. Um, and look for people that are complementary, not just like you. You need to fill in all the blanks. You know, your team should be filling in all your blind spots, mm-hmm. all the areas that you aren't strong. That's where you need all the strength. 
Yeah. I think that's tricky sometimes because we want to hire people like us, but but sometimes that's not the great solution. <laughs> it usually is not because that means instead of you having a blind spot, the whole company has a blind spot. Yeah. And that's dangerous. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh, this is so great. I wish we had a two hour interview, but people can gain so much more from the book. Can you tell everybody about the book again, where they can get it and anything else they should know before we bring it around the bend here? Uh, Yes. Unapologetically ambitious. Take risks, break barriers and create success on your own terms. And it's available at Amazon, barnesandnoble.com. You can get it at any of your local bookstores. It is absolutely available and it's in hardback, Kindle, as well as audiobook, which I recorded myself. So I'd encourage you to, to check it out. I think you'll find a lot of good value, a lot of key takeaways. If you've liked anything I've said, the book's chock full of all this. I'm happy you did the audiobook yourself. I don't like listening to terrible voiceover people do uh, <laughs> audiobooks. Sometimes it just, sometimes it's just not a match. It's like a mismatch, their energy or their voice. And when it's you and your book, it, it's going to be a totally different experience. So Shelly, why don't you wrap up by sharing with us three great pieces of advice that you'd love all the women listening with to take with them? Absolutely. So the first is make sure people know what you do. I can't tell you the number of times that people introduce themselves by giving their title. I'm CEO of XYZ Company. I'm Senior Vice President of Operations. I'm da-da-da. That tells people nothing about your skills, your abilities, nothing. So it's a complete waste. Tell people what you do. I'm the CEO of XYZ Company. We provide aeronautics and, you know, analysis for blah, 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 right? Whatever it happens to be head of operations, responsible for all strategic global implementations of software, whatever it is. And why do you do that? Because people do not remember titles, Mm. but people do remember skills. And when an opportunity comes up, somebody's looking for a board member who has aeronautical, analytical, blah, 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 blah. Oh, I was just talking to somebody about that. Who Mm -hmm. was that? Right? You just said the name of your company and the fact you're CEO, you're not coming onto mind. So let people know what you do. Two. Tell the universe what you want. I'm a big believer. Tell the universe what you want so the universe can help you. Most people want to be helpful. If you keep it a secret, nobody can help you. So tell the universe what you want so the universe can help you. And then the last one is realize that every time you say yes to something, you are unconsciously saying no to something else. Because there's only so much time you've got available, only so much you can put on your plate. So every time you say yes, by definition, you're saying no to something. So yeah. be intentional about it versus filling up your plate and then being really unhappy that some things that you really want to do, you now can't do because you filled up your plate. I love that as um, I've gotten older and wiser, it's easier to say no now because you know that, that it's a trade-off for everything you say yes to. Mm-hmm. It's it's so important. Shelly, thank you so much. I can't wait to dive into Unapologetically Ambitious. And I can't wait to just see what else you do. I'm just excited for this phase two for you. Well, thank you so much, Allie. This has been a fun conversation. I've really enjoyed it. We'll keep in touch. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Glambition Radio. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you subscribe so you automatically get new shows every week. And I'd love if you left us a review. We are on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and other platforms. And I'd love to hear from you. Come join the conversation online. You'll mostly find me on Instagram, but also on Facebook, Twitter, and more. Just head to AllieBrown.com. You will find them all there. And you can also learn about upcoming opportunities to meet in person. Glambition Radio is the elevated conversation for women leaders. And I'm honored you've tuned in.